He needs to sedate the elephant so that the snare can be safely removed. Guys, we are ready. We go help the elephant. This is good. I'm happy now the vet's here. Fred works alongside a spotter plane to locate the injured bull. He wants to dart it quickly to stop it from suffering. Okay, so let's go to the So Fred managed to fire the dart and the elephant's taken yeah. off through the trees, so we're just going to try and locate it. Choppers on the ground. Oh my goodness. Jeez. That's really shocking. I'm going to get a little bit of a black. I'm going to get a little bit of a black. Ah, my God. On his side, the bull's breathing is laboured. We have to move fast to remove the snare. Oh, there you go, pig. The poachers have simply used winch cable from a truck. A snare like this is cheap to make. It could have caught any of Weaver's family. The reason that this animal has endured this unimaginable pain is for this. It's tusks. It's just, it defies belief how cruel people can be to, to animals and how senseless this whole thing is that you can cause so much suffering, so much pain. For, for an ornament, simply for an ornament. It's a poor animal. He's treated with a special clay that'll help heal the wound. What do you think, Fred? You think he's? You think it'll survive? Ah, you can see the guy's body condition is good. He was walking, and also it was getting to another bad level, but it's still okay, it will survive. You see the bone is not involved. Okay. The bone is intact. Okay. So when the bone is intact, the soft tissue can easily... Really repair. ...recover, yeah. Finally, the wound is treated with an antibiotic spray. All that remains is to wake him up. My word. Hey, fella. Okay, move back. Not taking any chances. <laughs> These touch me not balsam have sprung up to cover the woodland floor. Each night, the leaves go limp as the balsam exudes any excess moisture. In the waterlogged soils of the Lake District, this is a handy adaptation. Soon their blooms unfurl. As the petals of these strange shaped flowers drop off, seed pods begin to form. These pods 
are the favourite food of the netted carpet moth caterpillar. Although it was once thought to be extinct, the netted carpet moth survives here in the Lake District, its last remaining stronghold. Touch Me Not Balsam is their only source of food. These plants have a surprise in store. Their seed heads explode. It's how they became known as touch me not. But nobody told the caterpillars this. The caterpillars have no warning when these little bombs go off. It's not just seeds that get hurled across the forest floor. Kenya, famous for its big cats, the supreme hunters. specialize in hunting at speed. Though fast, they're fragile creatures built to sprint after small prey. They don't have the strength or weight of a lion to bring down larger animals. This male is different. He doesn't hunt alone. He's learnt that there is strength in numbers. Just two, but three cheetahs. A band of brothers. They have changed their tactics and by doing so have taken their prey by surprise. They have learnt that working together they can bring down large prey. An ostrich, a bird that towers over a cheetah and is more than twice as heavy. It can't fly to escape danger, but it can lash out with a deadly kick. A female, unaware as yet of any danger. Even with three of them, this is still highly risky. If one gets injured, the other two couldn't hope to tackle such large prey. On the other hand, if they get it right, the rewards are huge. The male has spotted one of the brothers, but only one. It's not too worried. Then suddenly there are three. slower to realize the danger, and the cheetahs switch targets. It takes 
the combined effort and weight of all three brothers to bring down this powerful bird. Even now, the ostrich could land a fatal kick. So far, the brothers are winning. Ostriches have yet to find a way to foil such tactics. Even the river, normally a lifeline for the animals, has almost disappeared. Yet the mud soup that remains could be concealing a free lunch. If only the leopards can figure out what it is and how to get it. Are these weird apparitions something to fear? or a harmless and much needed source of food. The mother has probably never seen a live catfish before. Eventually, she loses courage. Perhaps her son will be bolder. He has spotted some fish of his own. When they stop moving, though, he seems not to know where they've gone. It's the elephant that finally reveals them. You could almost see like a light bulb going on and literally right after the elephant pulled out, he went straight in. It was like, playing with soap in the shower. He just sort of fumbled around and didn't know what to do. There's mud being splattered on his body and on his face. Finally, he actually bit it, which gave him a grip on it. I just remember that expression when he stood up. He was so proud of his achievement. He was quite stoked. Even when more sea lions arrive, they can't seem to break down the sardines' coordinated defenses. With a shoal this big, the sea lions need to isolate a smaller, more manageable group of fish. But with so few predators, the fish still have the advantage. All the sea lions can do is keep the sardines at the surface and wait for others to join them.
Tuna. Their arrival changes everything. Tuna attack from below, cutting off the sardines' escape route down to deeper water. Next to appear, shearwaters. Excellent flyers, but also surprisingly agile underwater. With so many predators attacking from all sides, the advantage starts to shift away from the sardines. As the fish pack ever tighter, their shoaling strategy now makes it easier for the hunters. sharks. They've scented blood in the water. Surprisingly, perhaps, the predators never attack one another. They work together to corral the ball of fish, taking turns to grab a mouthful. Common dolphins. As the shoal gets ever smaller, each sardine scrambles desperately to hide in the middle. But now there's no escape. whale finishes off the feast. Tons of sardines devoured in less than an hour. A mud skipper, a fish that spends most of its life out of the sea. It can walk on land, and breathe air. Its life is very different from that of most fish. A fish out of water, maybe, but they thrive here in Japan. So what's made this upheaval worthwhile? The answer lies in the mud. As the tide retreats, it exposes mud flats. Sunlight hits the rich silt, and tiny plants and animals flourish there. All food for a mudskipper. But life on land is not without problems. It's hard work to find a mate. Jumping high above the mud will get you noticed. With eyes perched on the top of their heads, the mudskippers keep a lookout for both friend and foe and males fight those who intrude on their territory.
they must also take care not to dry out in the sun. Rolling in the ooze keeps the skin cool and moist. For this smaller species, a better option is to retreat underground. So he digs himself a tunnel down into the mud. This heap of spoil is an indication of the extent of his excavations. With the tide flooding the tunnel twice a day, maintenance is a real burden. Her eyes and ears that were closed for the first two weeks of her life are now opening. And with this comes a whole new world of sensory stimulation. She uses her vision to move around. But does she see the world the same way we do? Well, dogs are colorblind. But that doesn't mean that everything is black and white. She does see color, but mostly just blues and yellows. It's because she only has two types of color receptors compared to humans who have three. And it's also why your dog will often ignore an orange toy in the green grass, as those colors look the same to them. Better to give them something blue. But it's when things are moving that her vision comes into its own. Dogs' eyes process what they see more quickly than we do. It's almost like they see in slow motion. That's why they're always in the right place to catch the frisbee. Dog's hearing is also superhuman. They can hear things four times further away and twice as high pitched as we can. It's why we can't hear dog whistles, but it also means they can hear the hum of lights and even the pulsing sound of a quartz crystal in a digital clock. But there's one sense she'll use more than any other, her sense of smell. A dog's brain is one-tenth the size of ours. But the part that controls smell is 40 times larger. They have up to 300 million scent glands in their nose, compared to our 5 million. In this tree, there is one of the most extraordinary plant predators. It's one animal that I don't need to sneak up on. Ooh. This extraordinary creature is half blind, half deaf, and this is just about as fast as it can move. That's what's going to happen to you if you live on nothing but leaves. It's a sloth. It's not exactly an enthusiastic leaf eater. A couple of half-hearted chews and the leaves go straight down to its stomach. Leaves, however, are not easily digested. The sloth's technique is to give them time. 
Then, eventually, this mobile compost heap pulls itself together and starts on a long and dangerous journey. This is a very unusual sight, a sloth in a hurry. It wants to defecate, and the only place it's happy doing that, oddly enough, is down on the ground. It only does it about once a week, but why does it come down to the ground to do it? And why does it nearly always choose to do so in exactly the same place? Whatever the reason, it must be very important, for a sloth on the ground is almost helpless. Any predator could attack it and it doesn't have the speed to escape. Why it comes down in this way is a mystery. Nobody knows. Now he's finished and back he goes up to the safety of the canopy. Leaves are not very nutritious. The sloth's way of compensating for that is not to eat more, but to do less. Its claws hook over the branches so that the sloth can hang without any effort of its muscles, which have been reduced to thin ribbons. And to save energy, it spends most of its time hanging around half asleep in the treetops. So, with very little muscle, and a reaction time only a quarter as fast as ours, how does a sloth's day compare with our day? In the time it takes me to write a few letters, the sloth just about manages to groom itself. While we have our lunch, the sloth nibbles a few leaves. And then, as we film the sequence for the series, it's time for another nap. Food is so hard to find this far north that a wolf pack must search hundreds of square kilometers if it's to be successful. And success means raising the next generation. To do that here, the wolves must work together. So the young are raised not only by their parents, but by their aunts and uncles as well. Together, they try to ensure that each pup reaches near adult size before the snow returns. A growing pup needs more than just a few leverets. The wolves need bigger prey, and to catch that, they must hunt as a pack. <laughs> Adult hares may be easy to spot, but they're far from easy to catch. They run at 60 kilometers an hour. To catch one, the wolves work as a team. One of them gets close enough to bite the hare's tail. But a hare can change direction in an instant. If it can continue to sidestep and jink, it may ultimately outlast them. Finally, it gets away. <laughs> 
For the next hare, the whole pack gives chase. Now numbers count. The lead wolves keep up the pace. Others run on either side, so the hare can't change direction. A tiny meal for the whole pack. For kangaroos, the greatest challenges come from within their own society. For a male, there's only really one key lesson to learn in his life. To get to the top, he must become a fighter. The battles are so brutal that males need years of training to prepare. The effort is worth it because a champion fighter wins privileged access to the females. This meadow is a boot camp for aspiring boxers. Training starts as soon as a youngster is out of the pouch. Its mother is a handy opponent for a young joey learning the basics. But he's soon off in search of more sparring partners. The other grown-ups are not so tolerant of this lightweight. This male alone rules the meadow. He stands eight feet tall, his muscles hardened by years of sparring. Today, a challenger for his title has come forward. Full-blown fights are so dangerous, they're not entered into lightly. But when two males square up, it's time to clear the arena. Anything goes in these power struggles. Eye gouging is entirely within the rules. So is kicking below the belt. The dominant male's skill is already telling. Stakes are high. They risk broken bones and internal injuries. Suddenly, it's all over. The champion has beaten off the challenger, at least for now.